In this video, I will be discussing some topics to answer questions that are common on Piazza about Homework 4. The two main topics I will be discussing are describing the ARP and PING protocols and going through an example topology that has a complexity in between the Udacity videos and the homework assignment. This will hopefully allow you to better understand the assignment and your toolset, which should enable you to debug your learning switch logic. The first topic is the toolset we are using for testing. In the homework assignment, we will be using ping to send packets from one host to another across our network topology. Each packet will traverse the network and activate the learning logic within each of the switches. Before we start talking about the ping application, let's first talk about the Internet Protocol Suite and its layers. Unlike the OSI model, which has strictly enforced layers, the layers here are more guidelines, but they still provide a useful model for us to look at. The four main layers that we have are application, transport, internet, and link layer. Starting at the application layer, we will have the data that the end user is trying to transmit from one location to another. In this case, the two examples are SSH or FTP to allow for remote connection to hosts or sending files between two hosts. On top of this is going to be the transport layer. The transport layer provides host-to-host -host communications. Two of the protocols within this layer that we have learned about are TCP and UDP where TCP ensures delivery between the two hosts, while UDP doesn't. The next layer is the internet layer, and what this allows is for the transport of data across the network. It provides the interconnection. It is agnostic of the link layer and the transport layer, as we've seen in the Udacity videos. This is how you can have the internet protocol, which is one of the protocols within the internet layer, on so many different types of hardware. And that's because the hardware is all at the link layer. This provides the physical links between two devices. The key example that we would have here would be inside of the Mac protocol, we have Ethernet, which is one that we are probably most common with. The ping application allows us to test the connectivity between two hosts on an IP-based network. The way it accomplishes this is by sending ICMP packets between the two different hosts. ICMP stands for Internet Control Message Protocol, and I'll go into a little bit more depth about that here in a second. The thing to know is that for ping, we will see two types of messages being sent, echo requests and replies. Since we now know that the ping application uses ICMP packets, let's briefly discuss the protocol and a few of the major points about it. The first one is that it's not designed to send data, but rather messages, such as the echo request, and the reply in the ping application. It is also an internet layer protocol, which means it doesn't know about what is going on at the link layer, such as the MAC and the ARP protocols, and its addressing is based on IP addresses. After talking about ICMP, which is the internet layer protocol that ping uses, we now need to talk about the link layer that we will be using. In this case, we're going to be using a MAC protocol called Ethernet where MAC stands for Media Access Control. The main thing that we need to know about Ethernet is that it addresses data in between two different hosts based on the MAC address. Now that we know that the ICMP and Ethernet protocols are going to be used to transport our ping request and response, we need to know how these two layers are going to interconnect with each other. The networking stack in Linux is going to receive the ICMP packet from the ping application and it is going to be addressed to a destination IP address, that of the host that we are trying to find. But we also know that the computer is going to have to send data over Ethernet, and Ethernet is all based on the destination host's MAC address. Because of this, the link layer is now going to have to use ARP, which stands for the Address Resolution Protocol, to create a mapping between the IP address and the MAC address so that when it receives a packet from ping via ICMP, it now knows how to encapsulate it in an Ethernet packet. The ARP protocol, which is this link layer protocol that will provide the mapping between IP addresses and MAC addresses, is now the next thing that we need to discuss. The way it is going to perform this function is it's going to broadcast an ARP request. And an ARP request is in the form of who owns a specific IP address, and this is broadcast over the entire network. The owner of that IP address is then going to respond with a unicast message containing 
its MAC address. This unicast message is going to be directed to the host that requested it. Now let's discuss the packet flow that will occur during a ping request and response. What is first going to happen is that host1 is going to broadcast an ARP message querying who owns the IP address associated with host2. Host2, upon receiving this broadcast ARP message, will send a unicast message to host1 with its MAC address inside. Now that host1 knows the MAC address for host2, it can now send the ICMP echo request encapsulated in the Ethernet message. Host2, once it receives this message, will then send a response. Now that we understand how the ARP, Ethernet, and ICMP protocols are all interconnected with our ping application, we can now look at a topology example. This example is a little bit more complicated than that was, that was originally shown to us in the Udacity video. The reason for this is that with two switches, it's hard to understand some of the nuances that occur as the ARP packets travel through the network and as these switches learn about the network topology because of the ARP packets. In this sample topology, we have six hosts spread across three different switches. The six hosts each have an IP address and MAC address, although these have been simplified down to a single letter or number so that it's easier to display in this small format. Each of the switches has its various ports labeled between 0 and 3, and at the bottom you can see the ARP table for each of the switches. Since no data has been sent through the network yet, all of the ARP tables are now empty. Now let's look at the example of where host1 is pinging host4. It turns out that because we need to know the association between the MAC address and the IP addresses, that ARP packets are always going to be sent before ICMP. Because of this, the switches are always going to learn the network topology based on ARP packets, and so that's going to be my focus on this topology example. It turns out that we are using ping solely for the purposes of producing these ARP packets. On the right-hand side, you can see the data that is inside of the broadcast ARP request that is being sent by host 1. This includes the source IP address of 1, the destination IP address of 4, and a source MAC ID of A. This data is sent from host 1 into switch 1, and it arrives on port 0. Upon receiving this packet, switch 1 looks at the packet and examines that the source ID is A for the MAC address. Since it does not have the MAC address of A inside of its ARP table, it now updates it. It now says that all data destined for MAC address A should go out port 0, because this is the port that this packet came in on. Since there is no destination MAC address, it will now send the data out, both ports 1 and 2, to the rest of the network. Upon reaching switch 2, switch 2 will do a very similar function. Since its ARP table is empty, it will also now update it to say that MAC address A is coming in on port 0. Since it also does not know the destination, it will send this data out over ports 1, 2, and 3. Again on switch 3, it receives the data on port 0, and now it has an association that MAC address A should always be sent on port 0. One thing that I am leaving out is that each of the hosts that receives these messages will also be able to use this data to build its own ARP table on the host. This actually means that host2 now knows the association between the IP address for host1 and its MAC address. Now that host4 has received an ARP request, it must now generate an ARP response. The ARP response is going to be a unicast message, and it's going to have some additional data because Host4 knows the IP address and MAC of both the destination and the source, and all of this data is going to be populated. As you can see, the source IP is going to be 4, the destination IP is 1, and the source and destination MAC IDs are D and A, respectively. Host4 will send this data over to switch 2 via port 2. Upon receiving this new packet, Switch 2 is going to do two things with it now, since this response has both a source MAC ID 
and a destination MAC ID. It will look at the source MAC ID, in this case D, and see that it does not have that information in its table. It will now update the ARP table so that all data destined for MAC ID D will send out port 2, which is the port that it received this packet on. It will then look at the destination MAC ID, in this case A, and see that it does know how to forward this data. Since it knows how to forward the data, it can now send the data solely on port 0 and does not have to flood the other ports. Therefore, the only device that will receive this packet out of switch 2 is going to be switch 1. Switch 1 will do the same thing that switch 2 did, adding MAC ID D into its ARP table and realizing that the destination address of A is already known and forward the data out port 0. Therefore, on the return trip, this packet will only transit through switch 2 and switch 1 and will not go to any other hosts. Now that the ARP packets, both the request and the response, have transited the network, we can see how the ARP tables have filled out. Both switch 1 and switch 2 have information for MAC ID A and D and the port that this data should go out on. Switch 3, on the other hand, only has information for MAC ID A. This is because the network is not going to be filled out uniformly as these ARP requests and responses are sent. In more complex topologies, the ARP tables are going to fill out in non-obvious manners. And so, for the homework assignment, it's going to become important to think about the problem and work through each step and see how is each packet going to move through the network when verifying if your learning switch algorithm is accurate.